this panel is about what cell and gene therapy investors are looking for now. Uh, to accomplish this, the panel, who has, as I mentioned, a wide range of diverse experience, will we're going to tap into that uh, expertise and learn a little bit more of their perspectives about the markets and sort of where the trends are going. We have one hour together, just a couple of housekeeping items. I'm going, we, we met in advance and agreed to sort of break it up into chunks. So we'll start looking back a few years to figure out how we got here. You know, ARM is the uh, world leading disseminator of the industry information on the, uh, on the markets and kind of the adoption clinical trials progress. So. Um, We'll definitely use that as a launching and a context setting point and go and move on. To set the mood, though, I'll ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about themselves, the companies that they work for, and a little bit about some of the investment highlights. So we'll just take a few minutes there. Um, next, we'll look at some of those things that are happening presently. So what are the trends? What are the in uh, areas of interest? And how does the team actually go through, identify, source, uh, and structure deals. And then we'll look into what are some of the context, sorry, what are some of the um, recent news events and regulatory outcomes and uh, discussions. So we'll have a little conversation about that if that's impacting their uh, opinion and their bullishness on the space or not. So then we'll look forward. I was lucky enough over the past couple of days to coerce some of you to ask questions to the panel, so I didn't have to think of them. Um, and so thanks to all of you who uh, let me interrupt your discussions and pull you aside for a moment or two and provide some of that feedback. So procedurally, the final comment, I'll shut up, I promise, uh, is to uh, just say I really would like this to be conversational, so please feel free uh, to reach around the the, the film that you're behind and engage each other, follow on to any questions or ask for points of clarification. The more they talk, the less I talk, and that's not a bad thing. So with that, please let's move on, and I will start then with Bola. Can you give an introduction, please? Hi, uh, I'm Bola Musa, Chief Scientific Officer of Chardon uh, and, and a partner. First of all, I'd like to thank Arm for having us here for another great uh, session year after year. Um, so Chardon's a boutique uh, investment bank that focuses on companies with five to ten times investment return potential. The key is that the companies need to create real value for society and obviously share in that upside. We've been a top bank uh, globally since 2015 in terms of transactions in the cell and gene therapy space and have helped companies like Moderna and Avexis go public. Uh, we're also known for um, uh, SPACs as well, uh, which we've been doing for about 20 years, uh, including the third ever, and there have been hundreds now, and I think Chardon has done about 10% of all of them in total, including five of the first five uh, biotech SPACs, true biotech SPACs in recent history, um, and that's as a sponsor, as an underwriter, uh, or as an advisor. So I look, look forward to talking about what's of a high interest in the cell and gene therapy space. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm Ed Hurwitz. I'm a managing partner at MPM Capital. Um, our firm's been around about 25 years. We currently manage about two and a half billion uh, in multiple fund families. Almost everything we do is biotherapeutics. Um, we're very focused early orientation, seed, um, series A rounds. Um, we like to, uh, we have a very large footprint in oncology, and then over the last few years, that's morphed into cell therapy and oncology. So a couple of the companies in that space that um, you may have heard of are Elevate, which has uh, really built a distributed business model around expertise in manufacturing at a time, what they put in place about six years ago before the industry started to scale and saw that as a, a, a gap that they could fill and then use that as a means of in licensing a lot of opportunities. So. Um, we've done a, a recent investment in Orna Therapeutics Circular RNA, where they're working on in vivo CAR T's. Um, we're investors in Emoja, which is a, a cell therapy company that's both working on in vivo CAR T's and uh, allogeneic uh, uh, CAR T and NK cells. Um, so we've been very busy there. I'd say our, our more recent focus has started to shift into RNA modalities. So. 
We've been recent investors in Dyne Therapeutics, Recode, which is a novel LNP platform. Um, I mentioned Orna, so we continue to push there. Um, we'll talk, I think, in a little bit about some of the stuff we're looking at, so I'll stop there. But it's great to be here and share our perspectives on this important field. Great, thanks. Yeah, Chris Garabedian, I'm CEO of Zontogeny, uh, which provides seed investment and kind of collaborative support um, of early stage biotechs, usually partnering with scientific founders, first time CEO entrepreneurs. Um, uh, that team also manages diligence around the venture funds that I manage for perceptive advisors. So we have two venture funds, over $700 million of assets under management, mostly focused on a Series A investments. So we can do both seed. Uh, investments and collaborative support from Zontogeny and Series A investments. Um, the most notable investment we've made in the gene therapy space is Forge Biologics, uh, which is a CDMO. They also have a proprietary pipeline uh, as well, uh, and I serve as chairman of that. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. Um, I'm Deb Palestran. I'm a partner at 5AM Ventures. I'm also head of 459, which is the de novo company creation arm within 5AM. Uh, 5 a.m. is a bi-coastal venture capital firm, um, mostly, fo or almost solely focused in life science biotech and mostly therapeutics. Um, we really do have a slant towards platforms in most cases as well. Uh, for 459 Initiative, these are um, ideas where we partner and seed very early with academics and entrepreneurs, um, sometimes with pharma spinning out assets uh, to drive a, an early concept through and get some of those de-risking data sets over the line to, uh, to get a company ready for Series A. Um, we just closed our seventh fund, uh, our seventh venture fund, so we have a $450 million fund that we're investing right now. Um, as well as an opportunities fund that allows us to do follow-on investments in our own companies as well as now uh, invest in, in companies outside our own part portfolio of Series A. Um, we uh, have a really large footprint in cell and gene therapy. It's a, an, area, an area that we think is um, really important transformational space. We have uh, some of our most recent investments in the gene therapy space uh, that have both come out of 459 in SOMA which you've probably heard about. Um, it's an in vivo gene editing platform. Uh, and then Akuos, which is a gene therapy platform uh, in the ear. And then um, in the cell therapy space, companies like uh, Vor uh, Therapeutics, Cavaletta, um, also interested in nucleic acid and protein delivery, Cargo's two new cell types. And so Entrada is a great example of a 459 company that is uh, in that space as well. So really happy to be here, and I look forward to this discussion. Great, thanks. So again, as I mentioned earlier, to set the context, it's helpful to look back a few years. I mean, many of us have been coming to these ARM meetings for, for a long time and watched it steadily grow. From a 50,000 foot level, it's interesting, obviously, the amount of enthusiasm and investment coming into this industry is huge, right? But there's been shifts over the last number of years in where people are sourcing, how they're actually uh, leaning into certain technologies. Uh, 459 is, you know, de novo company creation is, is not a new idea, but it's, it's, you see that more and more. So, well, I'm going to start with you. You, you. You've been researching this area quite extensively. Can you sort of point to two things or three things that have set the stage for this exuberance into the industry and maybe even give a little context of what is happening regionally? You know, right now we're in the U.S. Can you think a little bit about what you've seen in terms of shifting trends? over the last five years, and in particular, across the globe? Sure. Um, in terms of uh, shifting trends, I mean, um, I think everyone's looking for different ways to meet unmet medical needs, and that's a very un obvious point. Um, what we've seen is that uh, gene therapy, in particular, had a lot of great solutions, uh, a lot of excess old gensma, and companies did uh, pretty well by moving quickly uh, into the clinic, and we saw some multi-billion dollar market caps form. Um, and I think what happened, uh, if we focus on gene therapy for a moment, is that because it's a one-time treatment and based on existing technology, if a patient's treated, that patient's out of the market, there was a rush to get technologies into the clinic, and sometimes um, compromises were made. Uh, they're very high quality companies, but they're also uh, uh, constructs, technologies that are lower quality that made it 
uh, that were moved forward in sort of a race to get there before other companies got there. So we, we at times saw some publicly traded academic enterprises as kind of um, the, the loose way to, to call what we saw. And that led to some growing pains in the gene therapy space. But I just want to emphasize that when the quality is high, it's extremely high and really important problems are still being solved. Um, while I think that a little bit of quality adjustment needs to be made at the lower end of the range. Um, in terms of, if you're talking about capital markets activities, uh, in particular, uh, when we look at whether it's gene therapy or other modalities, there's a really big drive to go public in the U.S. We're seeing European companies because their markets are fragmented. Um, they really do want to get onto the NASDAQ more than ever. Uh, increasingly, they're also talking about SPACs as one way to do a list or if they're not U.S. listed uh, uh, or just simply as a way to go from private to being public. So the U.S. market is as hot as it's ever been uh, for foreign players. Um, if, if that's what you meant regionally, let me know. Yeah, no, fantastic. Uh, <clears throat> let's jump one and go to Chris. Any thoughts on where the world has come and how we got to where we are today? Yeah, I mean, first thing I would say is that um, clearly this has been the hottest space in the industry uh, over the last five to ten years. So there's been a, a mad rush and a chase, as Bola had mentioned, uh, to push these programs forward. But, you know, we all know drug development is hard. <laughs> and gene and cell therapy drug development is really hard. And there's a lot of moving parts that we've kind of gotten a little bit complacent with older modalities where, you know, these constructs are not simple, right? What is the right dose uh, window? Right? What's the right therapeutic index you have for a, a therapy? Delivery was mentioned in earlier panels. That's still a challenge. So that's the way that we're going to be able to address getting a more potent, right, uh, a drug into cells and still have enough of a margin of safety. And so we have to be very discerning. I think the success of Spark and Avexis in many ways with those big buyouts really got everybody excited and thought, oh, we could be the next multi-billion dollar takeout if we just get it into the clinic and get it into patients. And what we've learned is that it's not that easy. And of the hundreds of programs out there, it's really hard to predict which ones are going to emerge as truly the next generation of therapy. So we have found ourselves being very discerning, perceptive. Their public equity hedge fund and crossover investments have been very prolific in gene uh, therapy. Uh, but, you know, again, they are often very skeptical when we bring them very early stage programs where you don't have the same protein expression, you don't have the real engagement with the target, you don't have the proof of concept preclinically that you'd like to see. So while we look and evaluate at a lot of programs, we still find the bar is very high before we're excited in the earlier stages. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Chair. So, Ed, following on that line, you've been investing for quite some time. You've got a portfolio of very sort of innovative early stage companies as well as some more maturing companies. Your perspective on, you know, how are investors, how has their impression of the industry changed in the last number of years? Well, I, I think it's, um, there's a maturation going on. I mean, I think Paul has said it really well. There's a lot of one-off academic companies that are now funded and, and running around. And, you know, the, the, our, our perspective on this is that the, the low-hanging monogenic protein replacement gene therapy approaches have largely been picked over, and it's much now more about a consolidation play around um, organizations that have the infrastructure. When you run the math on most of these small monogenic diseases and you treat a single disease and you cure the population, you have a nice peak revenue and then it tails off. So you really need a pipeline of assets to, I think, stay commercially viable. Um, and so I think that we sort of see at least this first wave um, as really ripe for a lot of consolidation while the next generation of applications and delivery um, are going to sort of displace or, or, or come along. And so we're much more focused on sort of solving many of the key problems. You've heard delivery, 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 and I can say it five more times, but we're very much focused there. We're very much focused away from viral vectors at this point. Um, I think there's a lot to be done elsewhere. We've done some stuff in, with synthetic viruses. So um, th there's a whole next wave that I, I think is coming up behind this that 
uh, will benefit tremendously from some of the experiences. And, and I know for any of you who are in a company right now trying to get cell manufacturing done or, or vector manufacturing done, if you don't control your own manufacturing plant, you know, you're just sitting around waiting and paying money. So um, I, I think that infrastructure piece is a, a, a growing component of how you take control of your destiny on these. And, um, and I think it'll be interesting to sort of watch a little bit back to the original theme of co consolidation. Yeah, it was, I, I would say for me, this old Genza data was the big surprise that I think really transformed the enthusiasm for the industry. The, nobody really knew that that would work or that that would be safe, but the reality is um, it did and it, it inspired a, a whole wave, a massive wave of investment. And nothing's ever as easy as the first time through. So we're still getting there on, on these first order. Um, but what you saw were major pharma companies feeling um, the need to embrace this technology. And rather than build it, they've gone out and bought it. And so we've seen a handful now of very lucrative buyouts. And I, I'm suspicious as to how many more there will be. I think many of the players have made their early moves. And so if you're eighth or ninth or 10th in line, I'm not sure your capabilities are quite as valuable. So we'll have to sort of see how that, that M&A activity plays out. But once you get a product in this space, um, it's pretty clear that there'll be buyers of that technology. So. I hope that answers. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Thank you. Deb, as a scientist investor, can you sort of comment on the level of sophistication? How are you sourcing, you know, associates into your, into your firm to actually bring the technical understanding, technical knowledge up? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, just to echo some of the comments, you know, the, the clinical experience over the last several years has been phenomenal, and a lot of the great work kind of addressing the big issues that have been identified are happening at the academic level. And so a lot of the interactions that we're having with academics, um, and including you know, postdocs and, and uh, folks that want to come join the venture industry to, to interact and, and start to evaluate this work, um, they're coming up with this, this clinical experience and with this knowledge and with these kind of next uh, I'm going to call them incremental because I think there's much more for room for big step functions here, but um, innovations that are coming up to address some of these experience. So um, sourcing people to help evaluate is not the challenge that we're having. I think what's, um, what's, in, what's challenging is finding the great innovations that are addressing some of these big issues that have been popping up. And so I think um, they're happening in different areas. I don't think one company is addressing all of them. I, I heard the talk before, or the panel before, um, talking about modularity and being able to source different, um, different uh, uh, applications and, and different uh, solutions for, for problems like dialing up or tropism or, um, or you know, polycystron expression, et cetera. So I think there's a, a lot of different, um, different factors to go access from the academic space, but they're, they're pretty disparate right now. I, you don't see one person kind of solving all of them, nor should they be, because they're big problems and they're, they're, um, there's not gonna be one clean answer for all of them. Yeah, that's helpful. It's, uh, my takeaways, looking back, it seems like we're learning as we go, where a lot of the good clinical assets have been picked over. So leading back to you, Deb, you know, the 459 model of aggregating technologies and building companies and doing it on your own as opposed to continually seeking sources. Be curious how that's uh, played out and starting to shift into the present. How are you uh, building yeah. or thinking about that? It's a, it's a great question. I think, um, you know, as, as both as the, the fellow panelists have all mentioned, I think, you know, the, the days of like one person coming with the perfect AAV that's gonna solve every disease in, you know, your muscle is, is, is gone, right? You're not, you don't have that coming from one lab. You're gonna have to source multiple things. I think what we're seeing for 459 are um, identifying something that's overcoming a gap that we've already, that we've already established recognizing that we can de-risk one of those key elements and then realizing that there is complementary technologies that are being um, developed in parallel that we can pull in and, and access. And so I think it's really thinking about how do we, um, what are the needs for any given application? And uh, to Ed's point, and, um, is really not just a single gene application, but an application space, space a therapeutic area, a, a set of, um, uh, applications that we can build a company around, and then what are the additional modular pieces that you can pull in to really augment um, 
and, and address the broader uh, set of indications that one would pursue. Great, thanks. Before we shift into sort of the present, some of the issues and headlines that are coming up, I'm, I'm curious about how you all have gotten comfortable with the timelines in cell and gene therapy. Uh, is it too fast? Is it too slow? Um, you know, maybe have to start with you. What is your thinking on getting comfortable with investing in the time horizon for a return? I don't know. It, it, it feels a little bit like deja vu. Everything in this business is two steps forward and two and a half steps backward, another funding round, and then you move three steps forward. Um, I, I mean, I think it's been incredibly exciting and appropriate that, you know, we're talking about genetic diseases. That's why these are, it's amenable. And so you get, um, you have a very specialized, readily identifiable patient population. So you know, from a, a risk mitigation point of view, you have all that going for you is that you're only going to treat your par target population. Um, and to a large extent, these drugs have been, well, for the most part, safe. Uh, there's some exceptions. We can talk about that. But when you get a clinical effect, it's huge. And so the risk reward is very high. And that allows for these drugs to move extremely quickly. Um, now, we've all seen some surprises, and they're idiosyncratic. I mean, where everyone's talking about the Audentes situation, and I think that's a little bit unique to that patient population, but it's raised red flags, and now the agency is much more conservative, um, so it's slowing things down. But I think this is the normal course, but I would think that we will continue to see accelerated development paths here just because of the nature of the diseases. and the profound effect sizes that we're all looking for, which justify these programs moving to these unmet needs so quickly. So I, I think this is part of the new paradigm of genetic medicine, that things will move very rapidly from the bench side into the clinic and onto the market. I, I don't see that changing with the, you know, the normal variation or amplitude of um, you know, risk and, and things developing and surprises along the way. But in general, it feels like um, very much of a persistent upward course. Great. Thanks for that. Chris, in, in the same question, a little bit differently, I, I guess, would be as you are assessing clinical assets, you know, what is your take on the realistic or real reality that they're proposing to you? This is how long, this is the market, this is the opportunity. Yeah, like I think in many ways, Zolgensma and Avexis kind of um, sent the industry the message that this is pretty straightforward and simple and easy to get approval. And I would argue that SMA type 1 is a very unique situation where you have um, infants with the disease that shouldn't be there 18 months later, right, at best. So when you had a group of 12 patients, which by the way, I was CEO of Sarepta when we had a 12 patient study in DMD, and it really highlighted how different SMA type 1 is versus DMD. And so you had a lot of enthusiasm and exuberance around DMD gene therapy when, you know, look, the, uh, the markers weren't exactly clear that it was the same thing as a full-length dystrophin or even a truncated dystrophin that we were trying to do with oligos, right? Uh, the endpoints were not as clear-cut as you had with Avexis. So that's just kind of emblematic of what I think a lot of people thought that, oh, if we have a gene therapy, we get some clinical data or even less than that, biomarker data, that the FDA will fast track this and will make billions, <laughs> right? And the company will be bought for, you know, eight, ten billion dollars. And so I think that uh, it's really learning what are the right disease areas? What do we understand about the, those biomarkers? What do we understand about those endpoints? And it is taking longer. Everybody thought, I mean, if you ask those Pfizer solid Sarepta, how quickly they think they could get approval, I guarantee you their answer five years ago is very different, right, than, than what it would be today if you asked that uh, same question five years ago. And so I think that it's taking much longer, as Ed described, right, uh, and I think we have to be very humbled by that, and we have to understand that we have to deliver a necessary data set that is full and complete, and the totality of the data really needs to support a potential uh, investment. But again, I think we, we are not out of the woods yet in terms of safety. We don't have clear technologies, and this is why you see this proliferation of enabling technologies, better capsid engineering, right? How do we get, we saw two deals in the last uh, couple weeks, the Selecta and, uh, uh, you know, figuring out, um, and Voyager, right? Do they have promoters that can potentially avoid, uh, you know, immunogenicity, right? Uh, you know, do we have 
enabling technologies that can actually improve the chance that these drugs can succeed. And I think you're going to see more of a land grab uh, around those enabling technologies. And we've seen a lot of investment in capsid engineering, uh, some from, from this panel, that are trying to crack that code as opposed to just getting more programs that you can list on your website that are, you have a transgene and a construct and you think you're going to own those particular uh, indications. Yeah, that's really interesting. So for those of you in the room and at home keeping score of where we are on the program, we're just going to shift now to some of the more topical uh, nascent activities and things going on. Let's, let's start with the deployment, raising and deployment of capital. How, you know, what is the thinking there? And Bola, I'll start with you because you've been talking a little bit about SPACs and maybe you could give a perspective on um, how you manage risk and think about raising and deploying. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's always easier to raise capital uh, if there's breakthrough innovation, and there's a hint of that. So, you know, science is very key for us in our decision making. Um, SPACs, uh, you know, have become a very important tool in the market very broadly, and it's just now one of three different options for companies when they go uh, consider going public. It used to be the traditional IPO S1 track versus selling the company uh, to Big Pharma, for example. And a third lever is now to go public via SPACs. Uh, companies find it attractive because of the earnouts that are embedded in SPACs, which sort of reward the innovation that happens. And in fact, one company we helped had 750 million to a billion of earnouts. Um, and if you think about the traditional way of going public, there's three rounds of uh, th three different compromises that are made. There's a crossover to IPO, for example, that's two rounds of dilution, maybe 20, 30% of shares are given up each time. And then you're pricing the IPO at a 25 to 40% discount, right? So it's kind of like um, selling a $100 bill for 60 to $80 and someone resells it for 100. Or, I mean, should you be happy that, that it went up? It, you know, there, there was a discount there that didn't necessarily have to be there. So what I'm getting at is that SPACs are a way to do a one-step approach with investors who price it appropriately, and we're starting to see genetic medicines companies um, also appreciate this technology, including with the recent uh, Amicus deal. Uh, what we've done with our own sponsored SPACs, uh, recently Renovacore was taken public. Um, we just made sure that this is a theme that hopefully is a booming one, cardiovascular, uh, being addressed by genetic medicines. You know, heart is a target tissue for gene therapy. Rocket, for example, had a success there. Tanai has uh, come onto the market. There's momentum. And let's not forget that heart is the number one killer now as cancer started to go down in terms of year-over-year -year mortality. So always focus on the medical need. And, and I'll finish in about 30 seconds. But, you know, heart's number one. It's 690-some-odd deaths last year in the U.S. I think cancer is just under 600K. Number three is COVID-19 deaths, around 350K. And we saw that BioNTech and, and Moderna were two of the best value creation stories in the history of biotech. Um, and so again, you, you focus on deaths, on met medical needs broadly. Those are the right sorts of investments. And there are lots of areas that I think we could talk about. And I'll come back to you for a minute. You mentioned, I think it was you, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to pay attention, but you had mentioned that the competition for assets is, is very robust, right? And that people, therefore, are probably trying to go early build networks and identify some of these assets before, you know, there's 15 people in the line. What is your strategy for targeting, managing the risk, and then investing in those technologies? We, we like to get in early and do the company formation work, so we're, I, I mean, I, I'd say we're, we have themes that we have teams of people that are running around talking to the top investigators at you know 20 different universities attending all these meetings and sort of assembling a database and keeping our entire organization sort of focused on how do we solve a particular problem and so in, in gene therapy right it's cargo capacity so how do we get larger transgenes and is, is one of the key things we're trying to solve um, delivery, delivery, delivery. Um, I'm a skeptic that we're going to re-engineer the AAV capsid. I've watched too many of these evolution stories slowly deliver marginal vectors. So I, I'm waiting to be convinced, but there's a lot of really smart people out there. We continue to look at that. Um, 
there are definitely some approaches where people are um, putting binding, uh, modifying and putting a binder on the AEV that we think has some promise, um, some ways of directing the tropism. Um, so we, we've, we kind of look at these things thematically and then look for um, top tier scientists that have assembled the IP and the know-how and are out in front and then we try to bring that organ that and you know that science into and then with our team of we have um, about 25 executive partners many of whom have run R&D or, or functions like that in large pharma and they come in and take an operating role as part they, they help with the diligence but once we make a decision to invest Getting these companies off the ground is a lot of work if you have to start from zero and go hire a management team. So our model is to have that management team embedded in our partnership and we bring these people in. They help with the diligence and they raise their hand and say, I wanna go spend 80% of my time building this company for the next two years. And we're like, you're hired, um, here's some money, go do it and make it work. Um, so that, that's more our model rather than kind of chasing around and trying to get onto other people's deals in this space where if you're not in the founding round, your evaluations are just, we can't make the venture multiples that our investors are looking for. So are you looking for underlying enabling technologies and then sort of figuring out the indication areas to go after after? I'd say that they're, they're developed in parallel. I think yeah. we, you know, we're, we're it all comes back to delivery, right? We think CNS is tractable, but um, parts of the CNS are more tractable than others. Um, I did a deal in the eye. We thought the eye was a smart way to start. Um, it turns out that there's still inflammation in an immune system in the eye. It's been trickier than people thought. You got to deliver it. You give it subretinally. You don't get to the whole area. So you get some benefit, but it's not as curative as we'd like. I think we've all learned that. Um, so I, I think regional delivery is important. We're just in our own portfolio getting into the oncolytic, you know, the synthetic virus, um, uh, direct tumor injection, and seeing if we can provoke immune responses and break down tolerance. I think that field is kind of waned and we're hopeful that this next wave of, of product development will give us some big surprises and enable that. So we, we do think about the indications and how do we, where's their medical need, and where does the technology fit on, in parallel? So we'll think about how do we solve you know, CNS disease with the gene therapy approach, and what are the technology pieces that we need to assemble before we would launch a thematic company like that. Great. But your point is well taken. We, I think all of us have learned that if you have an underlying proprietary technology platform that becomes a product engine, those are typically the best stories because when you go to sell the company, you don't get paid for just the lead asset. You get paid for the, the, the future upside of the 20 other programs that you try to sell pharma are going to work, and you get some NPV for that. So that tends to be, I think, probably thematically, most of us would agree, would have been the best investments in this space. Right. Right. And Chris and then Deb, I'd ask you to identify what you think are some of the underserved or undermet needs in the industry that you guys think are particularly interesting from an asset acquisition perspective. I'd like to hear from Deb, but just one quick comment on this is I, in the last year, and I don't know if uh, Bull and Deb have seen this as well. It has always it's been a seller's market, right? And I'm seeing deals that two years ago, there would have been a frenzy <laughs> to get those deals, and they're coming back, and it's taking longer, and people are passing, and they're coming down in valuation, or they're rethinking their <laughs> right, cost structure and how much money they raise. And so I'm not saying it's a buyer's market right now, <laughs> or investor's market, but definitely there has been a shift in the last year to 18 months. Um, and so I think people are getting more discerning and they don't want to be sitting on this big collection of gene therapy programs that are going to run into real challenges. Yeah, um, I, I agree. I think that um, this is why we, we like the C model that we run and it's, it's similar to, to what I described, but we don't have the, the kind of army of in-house operators. We bring them in kind of bespoke for the company depending on the company, but, um, but you know, when you're de-risking along the way in the course of a seed, with the data that you're, you're generating and understanding, you can st still evaluate where do you go from an indication perspective. What are your next challenges? What are, what are the, the hurdles that you're going to have? And that really does feed into what 
What are the type of people do you need to bring in? Is it a manufacturing challenge? <clears throat> Is it um, a, a synthetic biology challenge, a promoter challenge? Like there, there are a lot of different angles to start to think about. I think the um, understanding that early in a seed and de-risking that data gives us a lot more conviction um, around an A investment. So if you're coming to us with a Series A investment and you want, um, you know, a $50 million round to drive something forward to the clinic, we're going to be asking for a lot of the data that we would have expected to generate in a seed and want to see that those data presented. Otherwise, it, it's, there's just a, a ton of um, hard biology challenges that folks are facing that um, it's, it makes it much more of a, a very deliberate uh, deep dive on, on the data to get over the finish line. So agree, it's not a it's, it's, it's no longer uh, the market that it was before for folks coming in with good ideas. You really need supporting data. Um, what was the core question? Underserved, undermet needs. <laughs> Underserved, yes. There's a particular area you're focusing yeah. on. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think some of the comments that were already mentioned, I, I agree with that. I think, um, you know, tropism is an exciting area. We haven't mastered that. There's a lot of work to getting done there. I, like Ed, I'm, I'm skeptical that it's just capsigen engineering. I think we need to open the aperture, think about other delivery me mechanisms um, for, for gene delivery. Um, I think understanding what is um, the right uh, sort of tool for the job. The tools, the tools have just exploded, so it's not just gene augmentation. We can think about gene editing. We can think about um, gene regulation with, with promoters or, or regulatory uh, genome modification or or um, integration there. So integration was a bad word. Uh, but um, but uh, yeah, so I, I think it's also knowing what tools exist for the job and what do you need to see for, for the um, indication that you're looking for? What's, what's the uh, required augmentation of, of the normal gene that you need? And it, is there the right tool for the job? So I think uh, an understanding of that when you're, when I'm seeing things pitched to me, that's, that's really important because it's not just um, a gene therapy is the right answer for every, every monogenic disease. Sure, so. sure. Changing a little bit thematically to the headlines, the regulatory, all the news that everybody's been talking about. We all know in 1999, Jesse Gelsinger died from the treatment. Took the industry basically out of commission for a number of years. We hear deaths in dentists and other therapeutic areas and other uh, holds and concerns. Why, haven't, why hasn't the industry stopped? I'm happy to take that one. I mean, the beauty of some of the uh, setbacks, let's call them growing pains if you permit me, is that people like Dr. Jim Wilson have been flagging these risks for some time. Uh, so systemic toxicity, he has a two-compartment model. If you go beyond some E14 threshold, you're going to see explosion of safety issues. Lots of people have been saying that, but certain companies have pushed the envelope uh, to support their market caps. Now, what's beautiful about the AV industry is that we've shifted dramatically towards local delivery, which basically gets around that issue. To the extent that companies insist on systemic delivery, um, we know what the threshold is, we know what the line in the sand is, so to speak. We also know that there are ways to improve manufacturing because there are all sorts of residual items and, and let's say, less robust manufacturing that could contribute to tox issues. There are novel immune regimens. Um, there's, there's all sorts of ways to, let's say, avoid some of those growing pains. Now, we have to remember, if you go into delays, which sometimes are associated, sometimes companies are using technologies from 15, 20 years ago, and again, that was a rush to get into the clinic. You, they don't know, understand their dosing. They can't tell the FDA exactly how much product is there. Potency assays, there are just so many, I think, growing pain issues from just trying to move quickly into the clinic to make sure that you're first. So um, when I see well-designed products that are delivered locally, the risks are just mu that much lower, and we feel pretty good. Yeah, let me just add, I mean, I think it's partly the devil you know, right? So we saw the more experience you saw with AAV, right, uh, Vector, the more there was a rush, well, we understand this, and there are many programs that have gotten far enough along, right? We understand the limitations with Lenti, with the adenovirus that Jesse Geltzinger uh, uh, received, uh, but nobody's ready to push those novel, newer delivery uh, methods forward aggressively because we don't know. And we know that, you know, 
the less you know about a technology, the better it looks, but who's gonna take that risk and when are we gonna see that turn the corner? So I don't think you're gonna see the field move toward you know, potentially these new vectors until somebody takes that risk and is able to show it. And guess what, we're gonna see another mad rush before we have exposed enough patients in it and there may be safety issues related to that. But one other topic that we haven't touched on is um, unlike rare disease, chronic administered drugs like RNA therapeutics, uh, there's a different lens you look at, and Bola alluded to this earlier. The number of patients can also dictate, right, how big the market is, whether there's an interest level. So if you think, you know, the traditional biomarin drugs or ultragenics, you know, it was fine to have a few hundred patients that would be chronically administered for life, right, for several hundred thousand dollars a year. I think gene therapy, you're really looking at it through a different lens. It's a little bit of first to market, and it's a little bit of, okay, one and done, right? And that's where I think people are very intrigued with redosing, if you have an attenuation of effect, right? Are there ways that you can start to monetize this beyond? And while we all want curative approaches, that doesn't seem to be that easy to achieve uh, in, in at least the longer term data we've seen in the industry. Maybe I'll just add on that because I, I think another angle of redosing and, and titrating in is really understanding the underlying biology, and I still think there's a lot of learning on the understanding biology, on understanding the underlying biology of what does one need to be clinically impactful. So you have tropism, you have you know, can you get to the right enough to the right cells? Can you get a, enough expression in the cells? And then what does that number need to be? And I think that's a big question. And then obviously, if if that starts to delay over time or decline over time, then you have a redosing question as well. So I think that there's um, obviously a patient population question there, but there is also um, an underlying biology question that needs to be addressed on that one as well. Yeah. If you I could to just oh, please. Add, add very quickly. I, th I think, you know, in investing, and again, I'm stating the obvious, it's important to look forward. What are the new technologies that are addressing? We're, we're literally about to enter the era of potentially of gene regulation, and I know Certain technologies have been around for 20 years, but um, you know, Mirror GTX will produce uh, data hopefully by the end of the year per their deck, and this is specifically using uh, on-off switches, uh, small molecules to basically be on-off switches for their gene therapies. So you can um, do vectorized biologics, for example, ones that have certain therapeutic indexes that maybe weren't right for gene therapy before. You can also do fast-acting uh, um, hormones or things that tend to flush out of the system quickly. It, you know, gene therapy can produce them, and then you have the switch to regulate it. Uh, there are probably about 15 different biologics, including GLP-1 analogs, insulins, PD-L1s. All of that is now possible with AAV. So, you know, yes, things are kind of crowded if you look at the monogenic diseases, clear phenotype, or a small amount of proteins needed for effect tropic vector right delivery, that was the recipe for success for a bunch of years, but now I think we're going to move into an era where maybe we can target larger markets based on validated proteins that we know pretty well uh, from big biotech companies. So I, I'd encourage everyone to watch those developments. Great. Ed, did you want to add something? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I feel, you know, we're at a cell and gene therapy meeting and we're only talking about gene therapy. and maybe to take you into the future, at least where what I think partly has happened in the investment cycle is while gene therapy peaked and we're now dealing with the reality, you have editing coming up here with some amazingly provocative results that just came out. And so I think that many investors are kind of saying, well, this is done and now I, they're kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So there'll be great opportunity as you've heard from the panel here, there will be programs that will mature that will be quite successful and I, I completely agree with Bola that the next wave we are looking at um, large market opportunities where we can control gene regulation and do some things that um, some interventions that haven't been in, um, at the forefront of kind of a, with a monogenic disease but I, I would say that we're very excited about the prospects of what can happen with editing but there it's efficiency, right? And then you have to come back and re-deliver. And so our move on this has, particularly on the, the editing side, has been to focus on how do we deliver and repeat deliver the editing machinery. And so that's where LNPs for us um, 
you know, it's delivery, 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 guys. This whole industry just keeps coming back to that's where the solutions are going to come from. And we think the combination of LNPs with, say, an editing platform right now. So we're in a company called Rico that's recently presented some data that with pulmonary delivery of a fully in, uh, RNA encoded um, Cas9 with guide RNA, it's been able to get to bronchial epithelial cells and um, edit the CFTR 508 mutation mutation and confer wild type um, CFTR and and even though we're only getting a few percent of transfection with each dose because we can come back and repeat dose you build upon that until you reach that therapeutic plateau and once you get about 10 12 percent of the cells transfected lo and behold you have chloride transport and we have now shown that we're more effective than a dose of or can be so I, I, would re I think the, the editing piece with LNPs and repeat dosing is really very quickly going to consume people's imagination here. Um, so we've made a very heavy push in, into to that set of modalities. And then the switches are one thing for safety profiles. We again think that RNA modalities because they're short-lived, um, solve a lot of safety problems. So if you can get the RNA um, into the right organ, and again, that's where new lipid technologies are, are going to play a big role, um, I, I think you can really start to, to tackle a lot of these next wave problems. And, and I think that will sort of be the next green set of green shoots, if I had to guess. Well, you rightly took us to task for talking gene therapy, gene therapy, editing, gene therapy, right? So but the other thing we've given some short shrift to is the manufacturing and the challenges and capacity that the industry is facing. I'd be curious to get your perspective on if you had a brilliant clinical outcome, but it, you knew it was going to be a nightmare to manufacture, would you, would you lean in? Would you, what would you guys do? I'll start with Chris and then Deb. Yeah. Well, Paula mentioned it earlier, I mean, there's a lot of local delivery uh, applications where the manufacturing burden is not as great and is ma more manageable. I think uh, the, the, the grand dream is that you can go after highly prevalent diseases with systemic therapy that's safe, right? That's where you really start to run into problems with, you know, the manufacturing and the scale and, you know, uh, supply chain and, um, you know, starting materials, et cetera. So I, I think that right now, uh, is focusing on rare disease, most of them are clinical stage, right? So the needs for clinical trials is not as great. And everybody's going to figure out, we'll, we'll deal with the commercial scale once we know that this is on a path. Uh, and, and so, you know, so you're seeing a lot of investment in the space. As I mentioned, Forge Biologics, one of those AAV vector GMP facilities, there's a lot of investment, hundreds of millions of going into, whether it's Discovery Labs, Resilience, others. Uh, so I think that, um, I think the supply will be there. Honestly, it's the know-how, and it's how do you do this efficiently, get better yields, right? How can you, uh, along with the better, uh, you know, capsid engineering, how do you make sure that you can have a lower dose burden, which helps us with safety, it also helps us with dose. So I think uh, this is what I was saying, you know, drug development's hard. Well, gene therapy development's really hard because of all of these issues related to regulatory manufacturing, right? Understanding the disease biology, as Deb mentioned, so that's our perspective. Yeah, I, I agree with everything. <laughs> I think, um, you know, it's, it's a, a space where, you know, the hope and dream is that gene and cell therapy can, can really impact a really large patient population, and the, the manufacturing's got to catch up. You're seeing a lot of innovation in the manufacturing space, and so I, and, and you mentioned them already, some of the, the key players there as well, but also, you know, other types of innovation happening. So I do think it's an area that we're, we're looking at, we're seeing more and more of, um, and in the right opportunities that we, we could lean into it. It's, it's an important space that needs to develop a lot to catch up, but you're, you're hoping still that these, these vectors will cross, right, that you're going to be able to impact large patient populations, then it's a really nice problem to have that you can't manufacture enough, so. I, I've, I'd add that we used to see companies go from research to clinical to commercial, and now a lot of the more innovative companies are starting with just straight commercial grades, so you don't run into, again, this growing pain of telling the FDA that it's the same product, and then, of course, it might not be. Um, early companies who don't have the capital, we're also seeing some really good innovative uh, business uh, structures forming. Virogen, for example, will work with academia to basically help them manufacture, I don't know, five to ten uh, products that might come out of that center. And so the manufacturing sort of, uh, I apologize for that, 
the manufacturing sort of, um, you know, better set from the start. Uh, but the old paradigm where you get into the clinic, you produce some amazing Avexis type data, you can raise hundreds of millions of dollars, that's still there, but it might take longer to get to the clinic if you don't control your own destiny or you're not partnered with a very formidable manufacturer. I, I would just add that I think that we have become much more sophisticated and, you know, the early phases you would get rush into the clinic only to find out that you have a do-over and your timelines, you know, you're such in a race to get proof of concept data to raise money that you're actually on the slow train to approval because everything you've done is a do-over because you've got to go back and make a new cell line and a new vector and validate it and bring a new product into the clinic. And so I, that's the reason we built Elevate and we, and, and all the companies we're doing, solving the manufacturing problem early, whether it be with in-house manufacturing or with vendor relationships that are proprietary is a, a key part of how we get these things off the ground. But, you know, when you're dealing with genetic diseases and they're curative, we've got pricing power in this part of the industry. So I do believe that you can brute force your way through the scale up on some of these high value programs and that will sort of be how we get through the first wave. But it's inevitable that both, it'll be even more critical on the cell therapy side of things that we reduce cost of goods and get away from autologous transplants. So I think that the technology as it evolves is gonna solve for the manufacturing dilemma you know, when you're working with LNPs, the scalability is, you know, orders of magnitude um, greater. So I, I think it's, it, there's bottlenecks in the system right now that are still challenging, but they're working themselves out. And I have high confidence that on the AAV manufacturing side, that's not going to be the part that holds back the industry. But I would argue that the future isn't really going to be necessarily around large-scale manufacturing. We're going to solve that problem with new technologies. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of territory we could obviously cover in this panel. We could probably go for three, four hours on some of these. Looking forward now and kind of prognosticating and you know tapping into your uh, retrospective experience and then starting to make some bets and giving away all your secrets. Uh, where is the industry in the next two to three years? What are you, what, what are you really excited about? Well, I'll start with you. Pick on you, your closest. Sure. Um, I mean, heart is a target tissue for gene therapy. I'll just emphasize the experiments have not been run. Uh, in, in, in most of the key indications that are monogenic. Rocket was the first time we scored something positively in our publications, and it succeeded because it was the right type of experiment. Um, I emphasize that companies like Verve are also appearing in gene editing. Uh, we're, we're about to hit a very important uh, time point there. I've already mentioned gene regulation. Uh, synthetic biology is more, uh, more broadly is a big theme we've been focused on for years. On top of that, um, I would encourage people to, you know, everyone mentioned delivery, 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 but that's true as always in genetic medicines. It's LNP, it's AAV. Um, the question is, can you crack the kidney, for example? You know, anyone who can do that, please let me know. Let anyone on this panel know. You're, you'll probably have some good conversations after that. And then, you know, their next big thing, uh, technologies like new vectors and elovirus from ring, you know, you could potentially dose with AAV, five years later dose with an elovirus. Um, I could go on and on and on, but there's a lot of innovation that's out there, and that's the great thing about capital coming into the cell and gene therapy space. I'll just go down the line ahead. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I previewed it. I, I mean, I'm super excited by what we're able to do with target with Tropic LNPs. This company we have Recode has. We'll see if they really crack the code, but they've they've identified LNPs that get to the lung both systemically and through pulmonary delivery, and it opens up a whole new target organ system. And I think editing there um, is. To me, that's what I'm, I'm probably most enthusiastic about is that combination of delivery and then what we're doing on the CAR-T side. We've got lipids that um, trope to the spleen and the immune system, and so we're able to create in vivo CAR-Ts that only last a few days or a few weeks if you want them, and we can engineer them. We can go back in and redose. So I, I think that's in the next two to three years. Um, 
that combination of those deliveries and then all these editing approaches um, and then you know let's not forget RNA editing is sort of in that thrown in there but there's a, a huge opportunity set of where you could transiently change protein expression or the, what protein gets produced so I, I'd say those are the fields that I think are going to boom here in the next few years. Perfect. Chris, what are you bullish on? Yeah, um, well, first the delivery issue, I think um, the holy grail would be a synthetic, right, chemistry that can get into cells efficiently with the right genetic uh, information attached. I think non-viral vector, right, maybe non-LNP delivery vectors, I think that opens up the field significantly. But the, the main point, and, and Bola alluded to this, I, this is a real, you, you might get an impression that we're, uh, you know, kind of less sanguine about the whole like, gene and cell therapy space. This is an exciting time. There's so much money chasing these problems, right? Uh, the, you know, the, the issue is you have different modalities, different approaches, right? The, the, the gene editing, base editing uh, successes we've seen. Uh, this is the first time that I can recall in the history of the industry that you have multiple modalities going after the same targets, the same disease areas, and it's kind of a, a competition. Who is going to emerge, right? You have novel kind of antibodies approaching certain thing, right? You know, gene and uh, base editing. You've got traditional, you know, gene therapy. You've got oligo RNA technology. So I think this is a really exciting field. The, the, the challenge is you assume everybody's going after the low-hanging fruit and that everything behind that is going to be even more difficult, and we haven't even seen that much great success with the low-hanging fruit. There's some, you know, signals in selected cases of very great promise. So I, I think uh, the next 10 years, I don't want to say the next two years, the next 10 years I think we're going to see where has this money been deployed, who emerges as the next generation of technologies, and how can that unlock not just the low-hanging fruit, but what comes behind that. Yeah, I um, echo a lot of the comments. So I think, you know, next generation vectors, doesn't have to be AAV, um, that can get to particular cell types. Anything that can bring a nucleic or protein to a certain cell type um, with high tropism is game changing. And I think it opens up, you know, there's, there's such a limited uh, set of places we can go to right now and such a broad set of indications that that gene therapies and nucleic acid therapies can impact. It's, it's a place that we need to develop. So delivery broadly is important. And really not being tunnel vision, thinking about LNPs, thinking about exosomes, thinking about just next generation delivery modalities. There's no reason why, we have so many tools in our toolbox, there's no reason why one delivery modality is the answer to all. I think it's, it's going to be really bespoke to the biology and the, and the therapeutic approach that one is taking. Um, you know, from, from the other angle, I, I've heard things, you know, in redosing, I've heard, you know, larger genes, et cetera, tropism, but um, I also want to highlight regu the regulatory genome. We haven't really talked a lot about that, but I think there's a, a huge place there, and, and you can start to modulate that with things like ASOs and other nucleic acid therapies. So I do think that's an area that um, is also ripe and exciting for, um, for exp exploring things that um, will gene augment in just a different way. So I'm, I'm quite excited about that area as well. Great, we are just almost out of time, so 10 seconds each. Which is gonna be your first blockbuster, cell or gene therapy, and when? Go. <laughs> <laughs> What's a blockbuster? <laughs> How much revenues is a blockbuster? <laughs> More than a billion. Um, I, I didn't see where this old Genzma was with the recent quarter, um, but IT is hopefully coming online, so I, I don't know what will be first, but I'll, I'll bet that old Genzma will get there. Yeah, I think it's going to be some derivative in the gene therapy space. Probably DMD is the, or DM1 may be the next two really big um, muscle diseases that will, will be hugely impactful. Um, I, I do want to make one plug, though. We didn't talk at all about cell therapy, and we're very much focused right now. I'm really blown away by what IPS cell um, and what these differentiation protocols, what cell types you can make, and how much editing you can do up front. And so the, the creativity and the imagination is unlimited on where we're headed on allogeneic cell, IPS-derived allogeneic cell therapy. So we're thinking about what, what, what's gonna break out in 15 years, and that's what we're trying to invest in now. So we don't wanna do more oncology, but if we absolutely wanna look at other organs for IPS-derived cell lines that we can engineer to regrow organs and, 
um, all sorts of tissues. That's a really hot area for us. That's, That's the what disadvantage we're of having one hour. We'll invite you back. For you got that it. Discussion. Great. Chris. Yeah, I'll just say we're, we're uh, decidedly uh, less bullish on cell therapy. I think the alginaic uh, allergene data with one of the best teams out there to try to crack that code in, in cancer uh, running into challenges. I think engineered cell therapies for genetic disease. These are, I think, we're farther back than we are with gene editing, RNA technology, uh, maturity, and uh, viral vector gene therapy. So I think it's going to come from the genetic editing gene therapy landscape. Great. Deb, final yeah. thought? Um, bullish on regenerative medicine and iPSC-derived cells as well, but I, I do think it'll come from the gene therapy side to start. Right. Well, please join me in thanking all the speakers. You notice that they're very enthusiastic and uh, they've talked for a long time. So.